The Christians in Corinth, they liked their meat. All kinds of meat. But the main meat market and the only distributor of fine foods was the local temple of the deities there. And if the average person was going to eat meat at all, it would literally have to come from these worship services and sacrifices to the pagan idols. They didn't have Dylan's. They didn't have your super targets. They only had the super temple at Dedimer. And here's where all the food, the meat, would come from. Well, this kind of left the Christians at Corinth with a vegetarian diet, a very skinny menu. Because earlier, the apostles back in Jerusalem, this is your, your Peter, your James, and your John, they were the ones that suggested that perhaps, now it's not a rule, but a request out of love. We're going to ask the Gentile Christians to refrain from eating meat sacrificed to idols out of love for the Jewish Christians. Well, the, the Corinthian Christians, they, they heard this news and, oh, that was a lot to ask to give up meat. You know, and I hear what you're saying, but they, they really thought about it. You know what? An idol is nothing, right? It's, it's nothing at all. And, and meat, meat is good. So I'll tell you what we're going to do out here in Corinth, because it's a long way from Jerusalem. We're just going to do our own thing. You know, and you do your thing up in Jerusalem, and, and we'll all be happy. We're just, we'll just handle it this way. Well, it's interesting to note that a lot of trouble in congregations, they happen through very good and honest desires. In this case, meat. And there are usually some really good theological reasons that kind of support that position. In this case, an idol is nothing. But when this knowledge and the good desire combine, it often has a great force behind it. And if someone isn't on board, tough. We're going to do it anyway. We voted on it. So, you know, either you're with us or you're against us. Oh, okay. Uh, well, so that leaves a lot of people, you know, out. And, um, yeah interesting that this was the, the situation in Corinth because they had a lot of other troubles. Paul had his hands full with his mission congregation. If you remember right, it was in Corinth that they were throwing such big celebrations for their Holy Communion services. I mean, it was a party party in which people were getting drunk on the communion wine and those who had to work for a living and got there late, they were excluded from the festivities because everything was gone. Yeah, they had many serious problems which prompted Paul to pin his epistle to the Corinthians. In fact, it took two letters. And so one by one, each issue was addressed until chapter 8, Paul writes... Now, about food sacrifice to idols. And he completely agreed with their theological underpinnings that yes, an idol is nothing. There is only one true living God. And he's the Father who created everything in whom we live. Along with the one Lord Jesus Christ, his only Son, in whom made everything and in whom we live. Along with the Spirit, this one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are correct. But... Those of you who think that you know, you do not know as you ought to know. Because this knowledge is just puffing you up. And it is literally destroying the faith of some of the new Christians that were there in Corinth. You need to know a little bit of background about those new Christians in Corinth. You see, Corinth was a city very similar to Athens, Greece. And it had temples and, and the worship life of, uh, was all around these pagan deities. The new Christians had spent all of their lives up to this particular point worshiping at the temples. 
All of their family celebrations happened at the temple with birthdays, funerals, civic events, anniversaries, special holy days of that God were all right there. And in these temples, they had special restaurant-like seating to serve the meals and the meats and all the fine foods that people really enjoyed. And, and so these new Christians who had come to that point in their life, having heard about Jesus, having renounced these former gods, their allegiances to these idols, and now have confessed the name of Jesus as Lord, they were completely confused while their fellow church members were still going to the temple. They were still eating the food sacrificed to that God. And they perhaps, you know, had it out with them. I can't believe you're doing that. That's wrong. And like, oh, what do you mean it's wrong? An idol's nothing. I'm just going there to eat meat. Okay. Well, you can't do that. It's not just meat. It's idol meat. And oh, just the arguments they had. And it's like, I don't care what you say. I'm going to go eat meat. And the pain and the dysfunction in that congregation. Some people were being destroyed in their faith. It's interesting to see how Paul addresses the issue. He doesn't go after the weak Christian. He doesn't go after the newbies, you know, just need to have a good Bible study on this whole idol thing, you know, and, and maybe a conversation with the pastor, you know, hey, and then we'll get you up to speed. He, he doesn't suggest any of that. Rather, he places the burden on those who are strong. Because it was to be in this loving community of the congregation where everyone was built up to maturity. And those who were mature already said, we don't care about the baby Christians. We're going to do what we want. And so it was there that Paul addressed it. You see, in fact, in every congregation, we all struggle with this balance between what we know and how we will love. Because you and I, we know lots of good theology. We know how things should happen in a church. What kind of hymns and songs to play? What kind of worship facilities? How meetings should be run? But it's even more than that. It's just general life too. Like whether you should be dancing or not. That was a big deal. Whether you should be drinking alcohol or not. The German Lutherans answered that one. <laughs> Differently than other people. And, and, and whether you should have insurance. Yeah, insurance for your church. And some people said, no, you've got to trust God. You know, God will take care of you. And then the church burnt down. And they said, okay, but you have to pay for your next church. It's like, oh, okay. And, and so all these questions, how are we going to use our knowledge and our love to care for one another? And so Paul wrote to the strong. And he said, well... I would never eat meat again if it was the most loving thing to do for our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. Rather than that they be destroyed, I'd rather just go without meat. And it's not an issue of whether meat is right or wrong because we know that meat doesn't bring us closer to God. It doesn't make us farther away. It's just meat. In fact, Jesus himself declared all foods are now clean and, and edible. And so that's, that's not the issue. The theology of meat is not the issue. But it is love. See, our guiding light isn't what's right. Our guiding light is Jesus who doesn't have the attitude of, well, what's best for me? Jesus, His heart is what's best for you. So you think about it. If this were our issue, would you give up meat? Imagine our congregation voters meet. You know, Toby's our president. And it's like, okay, uh, the agenda today is... Meat. We have a second on this. We're going to give up meat today. It's like, okay, we've got a second. Any discussion? Oh, yeah, there's discussion. Where's this in the catechism? What do you, no other churches are giving this up. We're the only church in town giving it up. And then people, no, we really need to care because we, we have some new people coming into church and, and meat is a real big deal breaker for them and we need to care for them. Okay, so we go to a vote. It's like 51% voted in. What is the other 49 feeling like? Oh, man, this is not good. <laughs> and, and so we'll just do our own thing, right? Well, what do we need to learn? Paul says, you know, those who think that they know that you just don't know. What, 
what do we need to learn from Paul? And when he says, well, knowledge puffs you up, but it is love that builds you up. Now, don't take away from this that, oh, we're just supposed to love people. This is how you fix life in the congregation. All the troubles you're going to have, just love each other. Well, of course that's the answer, but it just doesn't happen that way, does it? You can tell people to love you all you want. That's not going to make them to love you. Where does the love come from? It comes first and foremost from God. Having been loved, then this love now can flow out. But if you don't know who you really are in Christ, if you don't know the rugged commitment that God has made to you, that He's not leaving you, that you're His. And He will never abandon you. He has made a rugged commitment to be with you. Jesus said that in the waters of baptism. I will never leave or forsake you. I and the Father, we come, we make our home in you. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We are with you. And this rugged commitment is not going to break because, well, you're really being unloving right now. So God's like, whoa, okay, you're on your own. It doesn't break because, well, you don't really have your life in good order. You're just a big sinner. God will not leave you. Rugged commitment. Because this rugged commitment is a commitment to be for you. And if God is for you, who can be against you? Oh, lots of people, right? But if God is for you, what does their word actually in the end have to say to you? Nothing. Well, what about Jesus? But Jesus gave up his life for you. It is his blood shed on the cross that makes you God's forgiven, holy, redeemed people whom now have this promise, you're mine. It is this rugged commitment to you and for you to be with you that now is unto Christ-likeness. Living with Jesus who is living for others. This Jesus is in you and you are in Him. So that now it just... It would be a very natural and easy thing if it truly were the most loving path for us to take to give up eating meat. Well, of course we would. It's not coming from us. It's coming from Jesus who is with us. And, and to not do this would be to sin against Jesus. It would be to, to be mean to Jesus. It would be rude to Him. To be impatient with Him. To roll our eyes. I can't believe we're being asked to do this to Him. The one who loves us. So naturally it comes from us to love and to care for one another. And so daily you and I are being in, called to Jesus to repent. To change from our old ways. To His way of humility and meekness, and patience, and kindness, and mercy. See, our guiding path isn't a rule or a vote. Our guiding is through Jesus himself, who's in this congregation. And this congregation is a really wonderful place to be, because Jesus is here. And his love is being shared so freely with, with us and in us. Not perfectly, of course not. We're just like any other human being that we struggle with sin, but here Jesus is. And it's, it's a magnetic kind of love. People come and experience God's love through you. And when they don't, God is inviting us, challenging us to repent from our old ways, to be guided by Jesus himself into this love that is of him. May the Lord bless us as we live in this love. Amen.